Hello again everyone! Quick disclaimer, this video will be much more in line with my usual content, while still covering the ongoing war in Ukraine. What I mean by this is a return to a lighter tone, which I think is rather needed given an ongoing humanitarian crisis full of doom, gloom and war crimes, with Russia cluster bombing cancer wards while trying to kickstart Chernobyl 2 thermonuclear boogaloo by launching direct unrestricted assaults on Ukraine's power stations. Although, in fairness, this may turn out to be a massive bonus to the Ukrainian gaming industry, as the studios behind both major nuclear disaster series, Metro and Stalker, are based in Kyiv, and nothing helps marketing like gritty realism and authenticity. Both of these series are excellent, so I highly recommend buying them and playing them. It would help the guys from those studios get back on their feet after they finished kicking Putin out of their country and traded their Kalash for a keyboard once again. But... Back on topic. The reason why I'm making this video is a tale as old as time for those of us in the military nerd and armed services communities. Every time you see press coverage, you see CNN or the BBC or even Russia Today, but not anymore, <laughs> reporting the news about weapons and equipment being sent somewhere or used in some way. Hypersonic missiles, tanks, missiles, whatever. And when they cut to the footage of these weapons, you see a Boeing 747 airliner being called the B-52 Strategic Bomber, or an AK platform rifle being called an AR-15. In fact, I think every firearm has been called an AR-15 by now, anyway. Hell, you even see Russian BTR wheeled armoured personnel carriers being called tanks on a regular basis. Point is, the general public has no idea what weapons are being sent, why those specific weapons are being sent, and what the significance of those weapons being sent is. So, in an effort to give the average citizen who has the fortune of not being a member of the chronically depressed and argumentative hellscape that is the military nerd sphere on the internet, I have chosen to create a handy dandy two-part guide to the big name weapons currently being employed in Ukraine. A basic outline of how they work and why they are important. Although this list is by no means comprehensive, and the Ukrainians seem to be intent on diversifying their arsenal. But as glorious as that is, I won't be covering literally everything, as small arms such as the AK and PKM are straightforward enough to understand. Everyone knows what a rifle, a sniper rifle, or a machine gun does and how they work. Likewise, the Navy won't be covered due to the fact that the Russians essentially have total naval superiority, with the Black Sea Fleet, and aside from amphibious operations, they won't see any combat. So the Rapucha landing ship and the Moskva, Sovermeni, Udaloy and Krivak class vessels are just gonna go do their thing. But they are there, I'm mentioning them here just so everyone doesn't lose their minds. But it's really not a naval war, this is being settled on land and air, and so we will focus on land and air assets. And we're going to start in the first part with mainly man-portable anti-tank missiles, man-pads, uh, SAM systems, and sort of that general idea. And, as you can see by the beautiful image behind me, I'm going to start with the anti-tank weapons first. With the primary one of these, and the most famous of these, being the patron saint of Ukrainian Special Forces. The FGM-148 anti-tank guided missile known simply as Saint Javelin. In the late 90s, since the end of the Cold War, the TOW-1 and Dragon missile systems were starting to show their age. While still effective, they had the same flaw that current Russian missile systems still have. All of the heavy-hitting anti-tank missile systems of the 80s and 90s are either SACLOS systems or SALH systems, those being in English, Semi-Automatic Command Line of Sight systems, or Semi-Active Laser Homing systems. In basic terms, Sackloss means there is what is, I guess the best way of putting it would be like a fiber optic wire coming out of the back of the missile which connects to the targeting site on the launcher, 
The guidance computer in the missile takes instructions from the site on where the target is, and through that wire, it follows the path it sets out. So as long as the operator keeps his sights on the target, the missile will follow where it's pointing, eventually hitting it. Semi-active laser homing works in a similar way. And in fact, if you've watched any really big Hollywood military movies, you've probably already seen how it works. So, if you've watched Battle Los Angeles or Transformers, etc., first of all, I'm sorry. Second of all, you would have seen US soldiers using their SOFLAM system, or a targeting laser, to call in laser-guided smart bombs from jets. A semi-active laser homing anti-tank system works on the same principle. The operator has a heavy-duty tactical laser pointer on the front of their missile system, which he points at a tank. Then he fires the missile. Using the same principle, the computer in the missile and the launcher link up and match their laser codes. This connects the missile to that laser, and then it follows the laser all the way into the target. Kaboom! No more tank. Now, you notice I mentioned that the Russian inventory still use this method for almost all of their missiles, both SACLOS and semi-active laser homing. So, to cover all the bases I can, and given that the Ukrainians also use mostly Soviet equipment, we're going to go through those briefly. The main ones you will find are the Konkurs ATGM, the Metis ATGM, the Sturm ATGM, and the unfortunately named Fagot missile system. However, that last one does tend to lend itself well to the wry sense of humour of the war game Red Dragon community, as all I need to do is post a screenshot. See this, guys? The North Korean anti-tank crew. We're out here banning tanks with fag... Anyway, these are more or less equivalent to the US-made BGM-71 TOW system. TOW standing for tube-launched, optically-tracked, wire-guided. A rare display of brevity from the Department of Defense, which we are all thankful for. Meanwhile, both Russian and Ukrainian tanks, being former Soviet designs, can also fire missiles like these through their guns, these missiles being the Sphere and Cobra missiles. Now, ATGMs, as I said before, anti-tank guided missiles, are the best way to take out tanks, but for all of these wire and laser guided systems, there are two big flaws. First, to maintain lock on the target, you have to maintain your position and guide the weapon to its intended destination. As such, you are stationary, and have to maintain line of sight onto your target. If the enemy is vehicle is moving, which given the name vehicle is a distinct likelihood, if a building or a terrain feature or anything, something, whatever, gets in the way of that shot, it blocks your line of sight. Likewise, if something interferes with your system, such as foliage or weather, or even the enemy like dropping mortars and something and cuts the wire, or the wire could break or the laser beam gets interrupted. Basically, if the missile loses guidance, that's it. The missile can't function. And so there are a lot of factors which could interrupt the guidance systems. Second, tying this into the first point, because you have to remain stationary and maintain line of sight, this by necessity means the enemy will have line of sight to you, and you will be completely stationary. Hence, this tank or armoured vehicle crew will see someone firing a missile at them, as missiles usually have a flash and a trail, and go, huh, that guy is shooting at me. Perhaps I should, I don't know, shoot back. And given that most modern heavy vehicles have stabilizers on their guns, while you can't shoot on the move, they can. And if you aren't able to move, they can run delete.exe on your position. In the immortal words of uh, drill instructor Zim, he describes this situation thusly. The enemy cannot push a button if you disable his hand. So, if you kill the operator or blow the operator's hands off, there is no guidance system for the missile, and like an edgy, terminally depressed millennial historian, no, I'm not projecting, shut up, the missile will go off on a tangent and crash into a useless heap over in a hedge somewhere, because in this particular case, despite what the memes tell you, the missile has no idea where it is, how it got there, and it doesn't particularly care either way. So, how do you get around these issues? 
Well, the answer lay in, of all places, the aerospace sphere. During the Missile Age of the War in the Air, there was a serious race between the United States and Soviet designers to make long-range weapons that could take out enemy planes while posing little risk to themselves. Both sides had settled on two major weapon systems. First, there was the Infrared Homing Missile, or Heat Seeker. These were fire-and-forget weapons, meaning that once you fired them, you could break away and let the missile do its thing. But, being heat-seeking missiles, they could only really be useful for short-range combat because it had to pick up the heat signature. Then, there were radar-guided missiles for long-range combat. The radar-guided missiles, such as the Sparrow or the R-27 Alamo, were excellent missiles, but like the Saklos and SALH systems, they were semi-active and needed guidance from their mothership aircraft to work, meaning that the plane which shot the missile would have to keep its radar pointed at the target meaning, if so facto, the plane would have to keep flying towards the thing it just shot at. Which meant that if both sides had fired their missiles, both sides would have to keep flying at each other to make sure the missile hit, meaning it turned air warfare into a gigantic game of chicken. It was then that Raytheon and Vimpel, the two major missile companies for both the United States and the Soviet Union, had an idea. What if they put a miniature tracking radar in the missile, which it could then use to track the enemy plane by itself? And so the AIM-120 AMRAM and the R-77 Adder, nicknamed AMRAMSKY by the Russians due to the aforementioned AMRAM, were born, both of which were being rolled out through the 90s and into the 2000s. But during this development, the question was asked, if they could fit all of this tech into a moderately sized air-to-air missile, and that portable infrared anti-air systems were already in use, like the Stinger, why couldn't a similar system be used in an anti-tank guided missile? Enter the Javelin. Trademarked by Texas Instruments. Yes, that Texas Instruments. Could you think about that for a second? Can you imagine those poor Russian tank crews right now? They get wiped out, they get sent to the pearly gates, only to find out that they got whacked by the guys who make calculators. (laughs) Well, if nothing else, this invention proves that no one can say they aren't experts in division and subtraction. And so now, both US Army training grounds and the fields of Ukraine have a thing in common. There is a question often asked of infantrymen on them. See that T-72? I don't want to. The FGM-148 the Javelin, uses a very unique system, combining a missile containing an onboard computer and sensor suite with a launcher that programs the missile using a detachable command launch unit, or the clue for short, which is rather ironic given that the Russian tankers wouldn't have a clue what hit them. I wish I could claim credit for that joke, but I stole it off everyone's favourite air defence patriot missile Pogue habitual line crosser from TikTok. Even so, worth every penny, 10 out of 10 dad joke would tell it again. Anyway, back on topic, how does the Javelin work? Well, the Clue, Command Launch Unit, has an inbuilt thermal camera, night vision, laser designation, I I don't know, it's got God knows what. Literally, God knows what. Because that shit's classified to high hell. None of my sources who I'd normally ask for technical guidance can tell me anything, because This shit is classified. Point is, this thing has a full targeting suite and can be attached to a Javelin missile tube, which themselves are disposable. This gives the unit with the Javelin an advanced sensor capability, which allows them to move on foot away from their vehicles while still performing a hunter-killer role. You see, normally when you want it to carry, like, you know night vision and thermal optics and all that sort of advanced gear, you had to be attached to a vehicle or you had to be with your support units to do it. Now with the clue system that you can attach to the javelin, the infantry unit now has a sensor system that they can use for target acquisition, even without a missile attached to it. Really nifty little feature. The clue has multiple zoom functions, targeting functions, and again, a whole bunch of cool classified stuff that I have no idea about it. Though there are rumours in the background, not from anybody I know, but from internet sources, that there is some data link and GPS integration work in the pipeline that will allow the Javelin and its clue to be linked into the other equipment that's on the market today and in use by the military. 
uh, such as Blue Force Tracker and that sort of thing. But if that's even remotely possible, we won't find out about it for another 20 years if we ever find out about it at all. Anyway, as for how the missile actually works, it's all very technical and complicated from here, so I'll give you the easy version. The Javelin is a hybrid of a TV-guided, radar-guided style missile and a heat-seeking missile. Essentially, the soldier using the clue looks at an enemy target, which can either be a vehicle or a tank or even a helicopter, and then the soldier takes an infrared photo using the clue. This gets uploaded to the missile, and then the missile is fired. To prevent serious backblast, there is an actual like miniature launch motor in the Javelin to use it to get away from the launcher, so it goes a little puff, and then the main motor kicks in and goes in a high gear after launching. Then, after it's launched, the computer system inside the Javelin connects to the infrared sensor in the front of the missile and compares the photo the soldier took with the sensor picture it sees. The Javelin can reference the target data in the computer with the sensor and track the target, using the fins and rocket motor on the back to steer it. This makes it fire and forget. Meaning, again, just for reference, the guys that fired the missile can yeet enemy tanks and then make a break for it before the enemy is alerted to their position. Which, when you're a highly outnumbered semi-guerrilla force, like, I don't know, maybe a Ukrainian soldier, for instance, this feature is really useful. And thanks to the advanced targeting of the clue and the two-stage rocket motor, they can hit these targets from two miles away. In fact, further, if they have the latest versions. Now, next question. How does the Javelin missile destroy the tank? Well, since the development of anti-tank rockets and missiles, there have been many different methods tried to protect against them since World War II. The most modern version of protective equipment fitted to armoured vehicles is Explosive Reactive Armor, or ERA. If you've ever wondered what those weird-looking Lego bricks on the side of tanks are, that's ERA. Basic explanation, ERA uses plastic explosives in a shaped charge. A shaped charge is an explosive which concentrates a blast in a certain direction, usually using a cone-shaped device of some kind. This is also used in most anti-tank rockets and missiles, which use a concentrated blast to melt a cone-shaped metal projectile and shoot it into a tank so it melts through the armor and kills everyone inside, either by sending boiling hot metal shrapnel everywhere or by cooking off the ammunition storage, blowing the tank to hell. Because anti-tank weapons use a shaped charge, the ERA utilizes Newton's third law. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Essentially, the AT weapon hits the ERA, which then explodes, and the explosion disrupts the armor-piercing warhead's process, pushing the shape charge's explosion away from the tank. There are a million different variations and variables on how this process works, but that's essentially the easiest way to describe it. Does that work against the Javelin? No, because the Javelin uses a tandem warhead. The tandem warhead defeats ERA by having the front half of the missile blow up the ERA ahead of the main warhead, which utilizes the aforementioned armor-piercing molten copper cone, destroying the vehicle. Two warheads are mounted behind one another, hence the name tandem, which has become pretty much the standard for a lot of anti-tank weapons, including later variants of the venerable Soviet RPG-7. But it's not even this tandem feature that makes the Javelin so terrifying. What makes it terrifying is its secret weapon, Top Attack. Using the complex targeting system in the missile via the CLU, or the clue, the Javelin can be set to strike targets from above. Ever since World War II, people worked out that the true Achilles heel of any armoured vehicle is the roof. In a rather ironic twist, the people who used this information to greatest effect were the Soviets. In urban warfare scenarios, they realized that their PTRS AT rifle could punch through the roof of just about all German tanks. This was also put to use by the Red Air Force, who developed a form of proto-modern cluster bomb unit, the PTAB bundle, where IL-2 Stemovics, ground attack aircraft, would fly over columns of Tigers and Panthers, dropping armor-piercing submunitions, wiping out entire convoys in one pass as opposed to the uh, conventional rocket and bomb attacks used by the Western Allies and the Luftwaffe. 
So using this principle, the Javelin uses top attack mode to operate as though it was an air-launched weapon or even a cruise missile. It uses a powerful two-stage mode to climb up to altitude while its sensors are gimbaled to stay locked on the target. It then guides above the target and dives straight down through the roof into the very central hull of the tank, which, by remarkable coincidence, not really, is the location of the T-72's autoloading magazine, meaning that a top attack against a Soviet or Russian-built tank will punch straight through the ERA and the roof armor and go right into the ammo storage, resulting in what I call the T-model pop, as all Soviet tanks have a circular autoloading magazine in the bottom of the hull, When this ammo is cooked off, it takes the path of least resistance, which all explosions do, which of course, in the case of the tank, is through the turret basket and out the top, which pops the turret off. And it's this fact which is why you see a lot of destroyed T-72 and T-80 series tanks with the turret lying around next to a burnt out hole somewhere. Yeah, so the turret pops off. Really, really... It's really, really morbid, but at the same time really impressive. This top attack mode on the Javelin also allows it to clear terrain features, obstacles, and on the latest variants, it can even hit out to a longer range than two miles. Some estimates say up to three. However, the Javelin can also be used in a direct attack mode to take out bunkers, soft targets, closer range targets, and even helicopters. Because when you can do both, do both. Fun fact, top attack is nicknamed a curveball, while direct attack is a fastball. Because America. America, fuck yeah. Come in again to save the motherfucking day. Yeah, America, fuck yeah. Freedom is the only way, yeah. This top attack mode also explains the weird cage-like assemblies on top of Russian tanks. These are ostensibly designed to disrupt the tandem warhead used by the Javelin in its top attack mode. However, they are practically useless and more of a psychological factor, which has led to the Reddit and 4chan denizens of the internet naming it the Cope Cage. The crews know it too and use them for storage, and most likely they dry their laundry on it. It looks really handy for that, actually. It does ruin the low-slung silhouette of the T-Series tanks, which was one of their main advantages, making them easier to spot, but whatever makes you feel better. In fact, this too has another historical parallel. When the Soviets advanced into Germany in 1945, the proliferation of the Panzerfaust made Soviet tank crews develop the first form of anti-ATGM defense, namely the progenitor of what would become known as RPG netting. They attached mesh to their tanks in the hope that it would set off the shaped charge before it hit their tank, thereby nullifying the weapon. But like the anti-javelin cages, it didn't work and was, as stated, a cope cage. So when you combine all of that capability and that efficiency, it should get across why the javelin has been so vital to Ukraine's defensive successes up to this point. But to move on, this discussion of top attack weapons and disposable Panzerfausts allows me to segue into the other big name anti-tank system being sent by NATO. The n law. So, the Javelin is a big, heavy, and deadly weapon system, which dismantles armor like a particularly irritated blacksmith. But it is also 150 grand per unit. Yeesh. It also means you have to haul the clue around with you, which, while useful, is also bloody heavy. This is also true of the Sackler systems mentioned earlier, like the Toe and the Metis. They are very effective, but they are also big and bulky and need to be hauled around. So most armies, when in need of anti-tank solutions, go back to the ancestral home of cheap anti-tank, the Panzerfaust, and they use it for inspiration, resulting in affordable, disposable launches. The United States developed the law and later the AT-4. The Russians developed disposable RPGs such as the RPG-18 and the RPG-26, which the Ukrainians have used to great effect. While the British made the law 80, the Germans made the Panzerfaust 44, and so on and so on. 
But these launchers, as well as their reusable cousins like the Carl Gustav recoilless rifle and the aforementioned ever-popular jam sheet special, the RPG-7, are unguided and rely on being relatively close to the target while aimed by human beings, who, as we have seen in the recent War on Terror, miss a lot. So what if I told you there was a handy-dandy, semi-guided, fire-and-forget disposable launcher, able to conduct a discount version of top attack, capable of destroying even the most modern main battle tanks for the low, low price of 35 grand each? Well, do I have the solution for you? Behold! The Enlaw, trademarked by Saab. Yep, first it was calculators, now it's affordable sedans, but the good thing about knowing how to assemble vehicles is you also know how to disassemble them. Aggressively. And like their sedans, you can get a high-quality, high-tech product for a relatively low price. I mean, their more expensive products are pretty pricey, but the griping is just... Mm. Sex on wings. What was that? Sorry, got distracted. Probably noticed I like military aviation, can't help it. Anyway, this system doesn't need the long intro like the Javelin. It is relatively straightforward. The disposable launcher has been a staple of affordable and efficient anti-tank weaponry since Mustache Man decided it was perfectly reasonable to force 12-year-olds to kill tanks. And amazingly, with these things, turns out they are rather good at it. Morally bankrupt war criminal regimes, though topical at present aside, the Enlaw is a departure from the standard disposable launcher in the fact that it is, in fact, a fire-and-forget weapon like the Javelin, just without all the bulky computer gear. Instead, it has an inbuilt system on the tube itself. With the advent of the digital age, consumer electronics and military computers have gotten a lot smaller, while also a lot cheaper. But most of all, they have gotten ungodly efficient. Your smartphone, which you are probably watching this on, can run the entire 1960s Apollo space program, including the autopilot on the probes and the landers, and you'll still have plenty of computing power left over to still be watching my dumbass talk about weapons on YouTube. In short, the computer system bolted onto the Enlaw isn't that sophisticated or expensive in the grand scheme of things when talking about weaponry. And when you're blowing up a multi-million dollar tank, although seeing as it's most likely a Russian tank, we're talking about a multi-trillion ruble tank, that investment is worth it. Actually, now that I think about it, given the degradation of the currency, we could probably rent the Russian army off their commanders for a third of what we're spending in ordnance. Just a thought. Anyway, essentially, the Enlaw has an optical sight which directs the computer. The computer requires whatever is moving in the sight picture, and it can be used in either direct attack, which works like a regular rocket, or overfly top attack, which basically means the rockets fly over the turret of the armoured vehicle and detonates. Similar to a javelin, but not as high tech. The computer in this mode scans the target and determines the rough shape of what it's aimed at, then all you have to do while scanning the target is hold the target in sight for three seconds, wait for the click, and BOOM! No more tank. Then you can ditch the launcher and go get another one. And then another one. And then another one. Seriously, NATO is sending a lot of these. It's gotten so insane that even Luxembourg is sending them end laws. Luxembourg! All I'm going to say is, Vladdy, my guy, Putin, my main man, if the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg is stopping your armoured advance like a particularly competitive Hearts of Iron game, maybe you want to reconsider your military decisions. Just saying. Anyway, the end law. Affordable, effective, and awesome. So between the Javelin and the end law, we have tangentially discussed pretty much all the types of missile systems active in Ukraine, why they are used, their strengths and their weaknesses, and how they are employed. Although I did give the Saklos a bit of a bad rap, to be fair, given that the Ukrainians are using theirs to put in a shift. Their Sturm systems are kicking some serious ass. That just leaves one weapon left. Reusable launches. Rocket in my pocket and I'm ready to launch. Operation penetration giving you what you want. Brought a gun to an RPG fight like you knew that you would. Gonna find that RPG spot gonna feel so good. You know what this is. 
You've seen movies, you've played video games, you've watched the news since 1965. I'm only putting this section here because people will bitch and complain if I don't. Well, yeah, you left out the most important and numerous AT system in the world. <laughs> Shut up. My explanation is simple. This is the AK of rocket launchers. The moment you leave Western Europe or one of its colonial descendants, shout out from Australia, hi guys, you can find one of these RPGs for 20 bucks and a song. And ammo for even less than that. They have a lot of them. They have every type of rocket for them. Tandem, high explosive, anti-tank, fragmentation, regular HE, thermobaric, hell, it wouldn't even surprise me if they ran with the US Air Force's experimental gay bomb idea, and they have that too. Like seriously, this thing shoots anything. It works thus. Load rocket. Aim rocket. Disable safety. Offer a prayer to our Lord Jamshid for his holy guidance. Pull the trigger. Thing dies. Thank Jamshid or whatever deity you prefer for the smiting of your enemies. Rinse and repeat. If you break the launcher, don't worry about it. There are 400 more sitting in an abandoned shed at the back of your garden. Seriously, there are over 9 million of these things. China, Russia, Iran, and God knows who else are still churning them out. If you need a war fought on the cheap, this, this thing is the way to do it. Of all the weapons to come out of the Soviet Union, it's this, rather than the AK, that gets my vote for the most important. Anyway, that out the way, let's get on to anti-air weapons. So, man pads, or man portable air defense systems. The most famous of these being the FIM-92 Stinger Missile. Like all military acronyms, it does precisely what it says on the tin. It is man portable and defends against air attack. In the advent of World War II, there was a pressing requirement to improve the anti-aircraft capabilities of frontline ground units. Air power had demonstrated that it was the decisive factor in waging a successful campaign. As we are seeing today, the fact that the Ukrainian Air Force is still able to fly CAS and drone missions against Russian forces is inflicting heavy losses. The Germans, as always, have been toying with missile air defense systems of all kinds. We'll talk about the surface-to-air missile systems in the next part of this video, but the manpad idea was the famous Fliegerfaust. The idea being you fire a scattering of rockets at a low-flying plane and hopefully knock it down. This, of course, without any guidance systems, was a one in a million shot, and so not really any different from AA guns or just the standard machine guns they already had. But when taken into context with the V-2 ballistic missile and the radio-guided Fritz X anti-shipping bomb and the other technologies they were developing, both Soviet and Western weapons manufacturers recognized that missiles were the way forward. As technology advanced, there came the development of the aforementioned infrared seeker, which birthed air-to-air missiles on fighter jets, the AIM-9 Sidewinder and the R-60 Aphid missile, respectively. This naturally translated, as with the Javelin, to the ultimate conclusion. If we can put it on a plane, what if we can miniaturize the missile and its seeker so a man could carry it? There was one big advantage to the anti-air mission that made this technology available a lot earlier in the late 60s rather than the 90s. Unlike the Javelin, the infrared seeker technology on the man pad only has to track a heat source in the sky, which is relatively easy to detect given that there's nothing but cold air contrasted against a red hot jet engine. This means a man pad doesn't need a super powerful computer, it just needs a battery pack and an aiming sensor to guide the infrared seeker towards the intended target. And so, both the United States and the Soviet Union developed an entire series of these missile systems. All of them are now currently in use all over the world. The first-gen systems are the FIM-43 Red Eye and the Strela-2. These were followed by the FIM-92 Stinger and the Strela-3. And since then, various upgrades have been made to both of these types, with the addition of IFF capability, identification friend or foe for those of you who don't actually know, that's basically so you don't accidentally shoot your friends. While the latest model of Stinger and the Russian Igla missile are advanced enough to target aircraft and helicopters that use low signature technology. That's aircraft which try to hide their exhaust from those very systems. 
pretty much all countries with defense industries have made a form of man pad, such as the Swedish RBS 70, the Polish Pierum and Grom, the British Star Streak, the French Mistral. I would include the Chinese, but as with almost everything they've made, including their type of government, it's just Soviet with Chinese characteristics. If you're nerdy enough to get that meme, I commend you. Let's be friends. Anyway, there are limitations with this type of weapon. The biggest one is the one I've already covered when I talked about aircraft systems which use infrared. You have to be close enough for the seeker to track the target, and for the relatively small-sized missile to travel the distance and hit the target. This means they're really only useful for low-flying aircraft, which I'm sure you've worked out makes their primary job whacking helicopters which they do very well. As with another US-backed insurgency against the Russians, I hope this one turns out a bit better, the Stinger has been the primary air defense system supplied, and it has been murdering Mi-24 and Mi-8 helicopters for over half a century. And it will most likely continue to do so after you and I are pushing up sunflowers. So the question is, what do you do about the high-flying targets? like drones, bombers, and tactical fighters. For those, you need one of two things. Fighters of your own, or surface-to-air missiles. Let's discuss the latter. So... You need to kill something up high. Well, when you don't need it to be man-portable or mounted on an aeroplane, the sky is the limit. No, I'm not going to stop with the puns. They're a fact of life. Anyway, surface-to-air missiles are the most effective way to close off an airspace. To the extent that for an enemy to conduct air operations in your territory, they will first need to remove them by performing SEAD. Suppression of enemy air defense. This means killing your radars and then your missiles along with shooting down your air force. The Russians have not managed to destroy the Ukrainian air defense network. And as such, we have witnessed firsthand in recent days just how effective SAMs are. Their development, as mentioned in the previous section, is tracked back once again to the Germans during World War II. The most prominent of these being the Wasserfall or waterfall missile. They were designed to hit the Allied bomber streams pummeling German industry, the idea being this missile with a large warhead would fly into the middle of the bomber formations and explode, taking out several bombers in the process. However, due to the lack of radar guidance and onboard computers, hitting a moving target 20,000 feet up with manual guidance is flat out ridiculous, and so it never went anywhere. But this idea, like the one before it, was rightly perceived as revolutionary by both the West and the Soviet Union. While the United States would develop some truly fierce SAM systems such as the Hawk, Patriot, and SM series of missiles, the latter of which serving aboard US warships as part of the absolutely terrifying Aegis air defense system. Seriously, sp <laughs> that thing is insane. Google the spy radar and how it works in the Aegis system if you want to have a good time. Anyway, due to the United States Air Force almost always achieving and then maintaining air superiority, surface-to-air missile development was a far more pressing focus for the Soviets than it was for the Americans, and thus their SAM technology surged ahead and has roughly maintained that advantage until recently, except with the advent of the digital age. Basically, the Russians still have issues with like computers and digital integration, so ever since the sort of early to mid 2000s uh the russians have started falling behind on sams but up until then they were the best in the world and they are still deadly the way sams work is one of two ways usually first is semi-active radar homing essentially the powerful radar system attached to the sam tracks the target and then locks onto it once it has lock they fire the missiles which follows the radar lock all the way to the target Though some missiles, both SAM and air-to-air, -air, have a function called going active. These missiles have a radar in the nose like an AMRAM, which then track the target separately from the launch radar, though on SAMs, these are relatively rare. The other method is infrared homing, but these are usually short-range anti-helicopter systems, or even SACLOS guided via wires in some cases. 
The tracking system on the Russian Tunguska and Pantsir systems are exceptionally nasty because they have a high zoom optical tracking mode which allows them to guide manually onto a target at longer ranges, meaning evading or spotting the missile is damn near impossible. As such, missile sites have caused the most damage to Western air forces over the conflicts fought since the introduction of the SA-2 telephone pole SAM in Vietnam. As such, it was American pilots who developed the first comprehensive SEAD doctrine. They became known as wild weasels, absolutely insane pilots who would intentionally attack anti-air systems in aeroplanes. Attacking anti-air systems in air vehicles. Uh, You can see how dangerous that would be. So much so that to this very day, SEAD pilots in the US military who perform wild weasel missions have an official motto summed up with the acronym YGBSM. You gotta be shitting me. Anyway, with all that gone through, let's get to the matter of the day. Given that the Ukrainians being given patriots, while awesome, would be seen as tantamount to an act of war by the Russians, they will have to make use of their existing systems. Old Warsaw Pact systems that Poland or Romania can give them, and stuff they can tactically yoink. So both the Russians and Ukrainians are using the same Soviet legacy systems. For very long-range engagements, both sides are closing off airspace using the S-300 series of SAM. These are basically the Soviet answer to the Patriot missile, firing very heavy-duty missiles at over 100 miles away. They have a very powerful radar that can be used to track hundreds of targets at an extended distance and prosecute those targets effectively. The Russians have advanced S-400 systems with better performance, but as the Ukrainians are operating drones and their surviving aircraft are flying at lower altitude well inside their territory, this risk has been mitigated somewhat. The Ukrainians, meanwhile, having a large target-rich environment, have put their older S-100 and S-300 systems to use, downing several Russian aircraft. Next on the list, we have the Oza, Book, and Tor systems. These systems are self-propelled SAMs, meaning that they are either wheeled or tracked vehicles that have their own scanning, tracking, and prosecuting capability. They don't need a secondary radar site to support their operation, and as such, they are highly mobile. The Tor and Book are especially useful given their advanced tracking systems. The Oza, meanwhile, despite having shorter range, has the advantage of being wheeled and is thus fast, able to zip around and move alongside APCs and tanks on the offensive, providing medium-range SAM capability against CAS aircraft, close air support, and helicopters beyond the range of the standard man pads and AA guns. This capability is shared by the tracked infrared Strela SAM system, which does this same job, just with infrared sensors, meaning it has a shorter range than the radar units, but it benefits from the fact that infrared systems do not provide a warning to the target. However, speaking of AA guns just before, there are also radar-guided gun systems in use by both sides. The Russians have access to the Pantsir system, while both the Russians and Ukrainians have access to both the Tunguska and the ZSU-23 Shilka. An absolutely terrifying, rapid-fire, quad-barreled, radar-guided anti-aircraft gun. To me, personally, this is my favourite modern Soviet armoured vehicle. A-10 fans will know what I mean. Behold. The Burt. Anyway, that's it, guys. That's the first part. That wraps up just about everything I have to say about the man portable and defensive systems used by the Ukrainians and the Russians. This is part one of two. The next part will be talking about vehicles and aircraft. So stay tuned for that. I've been Anime Anarchy. Pac Man is my name. I'll see you next time. And as always, Slava Ukraine. Shannon.
пишу, прийти не в силі, а Боже я у могилі, у землі чужі довгі роки лежу. Чорна земля, зелена трава, небо блакитне, хмара біла. Ой, ти, батьку, батьку справедливий, 